Hey, hey guys, it's your girl Ginger Fox here. So today I'm going to be reacting, well not really reacting, sorry, um, reading a story um, on the creepypasta stories. This one right here, this app, and I have two other apps I will be checking out and reading as well. Um, I'm going to be doing these more often. Uh, I'm sorry I haven't been doing them much. Uh, Alright, hold on for a second. The cat's got you on the door. Right, I'm sorry, buddy. Come on in. Come on in. <clears throat> okay. So. Sorry that. Okay. So let's get started. So this story is called The Seer of Possibilities. Sometimes otherworldly beings find interesting ways to try and contact you. They might use a Ouija board or maybe come to you in a dream. Or sometimes to speak through another person. They each have their own style and preference that's particular to them. The one who contacted Jack spoke to him through a computer. Or I guess you could say the communication was through on-screen text. The first time it happened, Jack had been sitting at his computer playing solitaire. A blinking red light from the router indicated that his internet connection was down again. This was at least a weekly occurrence, and Jack was getting used to this body internet service. As he moved the cards, the game faded into a solid black green, and the te and the red text appeared. Hi, Jack. I need a favor from you. You're a really special. You're a very special person. I know you'll help me. I can't ask this of just anyone. I really need your help. Jack paused for a second. The ruder light was still blinking red. Is this some sort of joke? He couldn't help but wondering. Several moments later, sorry, several moments later, the message continued. Yes, Jack. I know this is weird for you, but I don't want you to worry. This is just a small, easy favor. I need. I'll just. I'll make sure you're, you're rewarded. Now, nearly in a panic, Jack reached around and pulled the internet cable completely from the wall. Still here, Jack. I don't want to waste any more of your time, so I'll get right to what I need. Tomorrow, when you go to work, I need you to move the large potted plant that's next to the elevator onto on the ground floor. All you have to do is pull it out three inches from the wall. If you do it at 8.17 a.m., nobody else will be in the area. Jack sat there, refusing to respond, still trying to figure out what was happening. The writing continued. Look, Jack, I'm asking you because I know you'll do it. You won't let me down. You're special. We'll talk tomorrow. Jack pulled the power cord from the wall, and the computer went blank. Did that really just happen? He thought. Still shaking from the experience, he took a warm shower and got ready for bed, convincing his shit convincing himself that he'd either had been cr had some crazy dream or it was or that or that this was I should say just some elaborate joke but who would play that kind of joke on him he didn't really have friends or enemies he woke up the next morning feeling refreshed work was there at 8 30 a.m and Jack was never late he pulled into the parking lot at 810. Normally he go just go right in, but the message had told him to move the plane at 817 AM. Was he really gonna do it? Overnight, Jack's fear had turned into curiosity. Let's say he moved the plant. He wouldn't be doing anything wrong or illegal, right? In Jack's mind, the worst reasonable course of action was to move the plant. He'd do it. Nothing would happen. And he'd be able to put his be able to put this whole crazy matter behind him. One minute before six, before eight seventeen. Sorry, Jack left his car and walked towards the building. He entered the foyer at the exact time he was supposed to. The message was right. No, nobody else was around. Odd, Jack thought. The building was normally busy this t this time of morning, but this temporary lull had been accurately, accurately predicted. Fine. Let's see what happens, Jack muttered to himself. He walked up to the large potted plant placed firmly between the two elevators in the lobby of the 10-story building. The plant looked like it was fake. A decoration people passed every day without really noticing. 
It was heavier than Jack realized. He put some might into his effort and pulled the planet three inches to his best estimate. He stood back and looked at the plant, then looked around the lobby. People were coming in behind him now, and the lobby was starting to fill up again. Nobody seemed to notice the plant was in a slightly different location. Nothing seemed different at all. Jack skipped the next elevator and waited, waited for something, but nothing, but nothing happened. Finally, Jack entered the elevator and made it to his seventh floor cubic, pub, cubicle. On Tom, like always, if you ever ask Jack's co-worker to describe him, you hear words like polite, quiet, respectful, and com- competent. And while those words were all accurate, they gave little indications of the truth. The truth that Jack really didn't like most people. That's not to say he disliked them, just that he had very little interest in getting to know them or being their friend, save for one. Allie, the girl who sat two cubicles down from him, was the only person he wanted to know more about. Was her big smile, blonde hair, and beautiful figure. Jack was more interest, interested in learning about uh, in learning all about her. Despite his lack of success with women in the past, he was actually doing a fair job getting to know her. Every morning, as he passed her cubicle, he stopped for a chat. The chats were one minute at first, then two minutes, then several minutes. Jack was surprised that she actually seemed to like him. On this particular morning, their delayed conversation lasted only a couple minutes, and they exchanged their morning greetings and walked about. Allie's wild nut out. The elevator doors opened up behind him. Out hobbled James Bentley, the boss of both Jack and Allie. James' loud complaining could be heard through at the office. My darn foot! What happened, James? Came the mumble quarries. At that damn plant they have in the lobby, I am, I ran right into it and twisted my ankle. James, you can barely walk. You need to go to the hospital, came Allie's concerned reply. Can't do it now. I had meetings all day. Too important to cancel. I'll just have to tough it out. Jack, feeling stunned, left Allie's cubicle mid conversation and sunk down into a chair. It was his fault. He was sure of it. How could he have been so stupid and careless? Still, no use in worrying about it now. A twisted ankle would heal. Everything would be all right. Upon his return home, Jack went immediately to his computer and turned it on. As soon as the computer booted up, the screen went black and a new message popped up. How was your day, Jack? He sat there, staring at the screen, not knowing how to answer. The message on the screen continued. Actually, I know how your day was, but never let it be said that I'm not polite. You're wondering what's going on. You want to know why James Bentley had to twist his ankle? Well, Jack, the chain of events isn't done playing you. I don't want to tell you too much just too soon, but this will all make sense to you in short order. Just go to work tomorrow like you normally do. Don't worry about a thing, Jack. You'll be rewarded. You're special. Talk to you tomorrow. Jack sat back in his chair. What was going on? Who was, who was this sending him messages? Jack's curiosity was fully engaged, and he was almost a bit excited to see what would happen next. The next morning at work started off as an ordinary day. Jack noticed that the plant had been pushed back fully against the wall, probably by the night cleaning crew. James Bentley showed up shortly after lunch, hobbling into the office on his one good foot. Man, this foot is killing me, Jack could overhear him say, but apparently James still had a meeting he didn't want to miss. He wasn't until around 3 o'clock that Jack saw him again, James who always seemed to prefer Allie over others, came limping up to her cubicle. Allie, you're not doing anything right now, are you? Um, no. Nothing nothing that can't wait until tomorrow, I guess. Good. Could you please drive me to see my doctor? I probably should have gone yesterday, but I just couldn't get away. The pain is just killing me right now, and I don't think I can drive myself. I barely made it here this morning, and I don't think I can even push the gas pedal right now. We can take my car if you want. Yeah, that's fine, James. I don't have a problem taking you. Turning to Jack, she said her goodbye. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Jackie. She put on her coat and slowly followed James as he struggled down the hallway. 
She gave a half turn and a shrug in Jack's direction with a little smile as she walked away. Jack felt even lonelier than normal than normal when she was gone. It was ten minutes later that they all heard the crash. It was preceded by the loud horn of an 18-wheeler and screeching brakes. The collision itself was a sickening thud of two large metal objects clotting. Even on the seventh floor, it was loud. The office workers gasped and ran to the windows. Is that James Carr? One of the mass. Hard to tell from up, from up here. Someone responded. It's so banged up. The horrifying implication of what just happened came to Jack immediately. No, 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 he thought. It can't be true. Checking all the way, he ran to the elevator and went to the ground floor along with several others from the office. Some of them were crying. As they joined them, the growing crowd around the scene of the accident. Jack could hear the far-off sound of emergency sirens. Looking past the gawkers, he could see that the 18 wheeler had hit James Carr broadside. <clears throat> broadside, sorry. Uh, its driver had been thrown out onto the pavement where he lay motionless. James was sitting in the passenger seat of a car motionless, but with a surprised look on his bloody face. Jack couldn't tell if he was alive or not. The driver's side where Allie was seated had taken the hit. The space she'd been occupying had been compacted to the third of its original size. Allie's head was smashed open and her twisted body was broken and battered. The crowd was stunned. Tears screamed sirens. That was all Jack could hear. Without going back inside the building, Jack ran to his car and drove home, angry and sad. He made the journey home and to his computer. There the machine sat. He wanted to turn it on, but was afraid to f- afraid of what he found out. Was he really the one responsible for Allie's death? The whole chain of events had started with him. He knew he was to blame. Jack reached for the power button and then pulled his hand back. Finally, after several minutes, he found the mental strength to turn it on. The screen flicked and then went black and the familiar text started appearing on the screen. No, Jack, it's not your fault. I know you're blaming yourself, but all people die eventually. Sooner, some get sooner than others. Jack stared at the screen. He resisted the earth and threw the monitor to the ground. After a moment, the writing continued. Jack, I'm going to tell you something, and I really need you to seriously consider everything I'm about to say. You thought you were in love with Allie. The truth is, you just wanted to screw her. Oh my goodness, okay. And please keep my language, but every once in a great while, it's best to be blunt, Jack. She wasn't the one for you. She, she would have made your life miserable. Yes, you would have eventually found the courage to ask her out. She actually was interest, interested in you. She thought you'd make a good project. Sad, really, for her, not for you. I want you to think back to all the things she told you. Why did her last boyfriend break out of her? Because she cheated on him. Jack mumbled under his breath. Because she cheated on him, Jack. The same thing she would have done to you. She would have made you happy for about two months and then miserable for the next four years. Sneaking around laughing at you behind your back. Spending all your money. Wouldn't you finally get rid of her? You would have been so jaded. So, so jaded, sorry. That you'd, never, that you'd never date again. That is true, Jack. I see all future possibilities. The ones that come to pass and the ones that don't. You've seen how she really is, Jack, but you let your lust for her blind you the truth. Together, you and I made sure you avoided that path. One more thing, Jack. This isn't done playing out yet. There's more to come. No. You killed her. Jack screamed and threw the monitor from the desk. It landed on the floor and sparked out. Jack got barely in his sleep that night, and the next day he wasn't sure he wanted to go to work, but the last words he'd been told had peculiar his curiosity and his anger has somewhat su- subsided. No work was done that day at the office. The company brought in grief counselors. People shared their thoughts. They cried. They hugged. James had actually survived the accident but was in a coma. The doctors thought he might recover eventually but nobody was really sure. Late in the afternoon, Jack was approached by Diego, the head of the, of the division. Diego was blunt and up front and they offered James position to Jack. 
technically would be a temporary promotion, but James wouldn't be back at any time soon. Diego promised him the, that, that the promotion would be made permanent once enough time had passed. Let's keep this low key for now, Diego told him. I know it might seem, seem quick, but the Lancaster project James was working on can't be stopped. It's too important to the company. I need someone in charge right, right away. They can't wait. Stunned, Jack accepted the promotion. He left work with a strange mixture of feelings. Not really sure how he felt about anything. On his way home, he stopped at the electronic store and brought, bought a new monitor. He made it home and powered up the computer. Once again, the writing came on the screen. Jack, I want to be the first to congratulate you. I'm proud of what you've, you've accomplished. Jack stared at the screen. Jack, I had to ask your forgiveness because I haven't introduced myself yet. I'm called the seer. Look, I told you before, I see what will be. And I see what can be. It's a very powerful gift I have. But you know what, Jack? For all my power, I still can't do anything corporeal. Corporeal. I can predict. I can see. And with enough effort, I can even communicate. But I don't have a body. There's something. That's something that was taken from me a long, long time ago. That's why I need you, Jack. I'm an artist of sorts. An artist of human manipulation. You'll be my paintbrush and my canvas. I want you to work with me, Jack. It's all very simple. Just perform simple tasks for me from time to time. Jack was becoming more and more curious. Oh, goodness. Of course. And Jack, before you give me an answer, I want you to know a couple of things. First off, I'll, I've, I'll, I can't speak to that. I'll never lie to you. Secondly, I'll never ask you to do anything which, taken by itself, is wrong or legal. Yes, bad things will result. And sometimes people will die. But they're going to die event eventually anyways. Right, Jack? And the bad will always be balanced out by something good happening to you. Jack wince at this last idea, but he fought the urge to turn the computer off. The seer was right. Everyone would die eventually. Why not let something good come to come of it? And what about never lying to him? If he'd known at the time that Allie was going to die... He'd have never gone through what the, with the original favor. But as he thought more about it, he realized the seer hadn't lied to him. But had only withheld information. Still, Jack, wondering if he could trust the seer. Work with me, Jack. Together we'll make incredible things happen. I'm just asking you to perform little tasks from time to time. Oh, but these little tasks will have great consequences. They're going to be beautiful, Jack. And they'll always end with a reward for you. That's the beauty of my art. One single task pr produces something bad and something good. Oh, one last thing, Jack. I can see you're having trouble with this. But I thought talking to you right now, it would take you a bit two weeks to decide to join me. But you know what, Jack? You would join me. That's not... That's right. You're going to say yes. So instead of waiting, why don't you say yes to me now? Let's get started, Jack. And when all this is over, you're going to thank me. I promise you. Jack considered what the seer had just said. His initial feeling of revolt was slowly fading. He paused, and then for the first time, he placed his fingers on the keyboard and responded directly to the seer. What do you want me to do next? A year passed. Jack did every favor the seer asked of him, and as the seer had promised, Jack was rewarded for his actions each time. The rewards often came in unexpected, unexpected and interesting ways. One of the most... Memorable experiences for Jack happened about two years after he first agreed to help the seer. Jack, I need you to go downtown tomorrow, the seer requested. Enter Garmin's liquor at exactly 12.37 p.m. A man will ask you a question. The answer you're going to give him is 27. As always, the seer's instructions were simple and direct, yet mysterious. The next day, as requested, Jack entered the door. In front of him, a blurry construction worker was at the counter, feeling a lottery place. Place flip. Let's see here, said the con construction worker. My birthday, that's the 15th. My wife's birthday, that's the 24th. And my kids' ages, 2, 10, and 13. The man tricks his head and looked around, zeroing in on Jack. Hey, buddy, I need their number. You got one for me? Jack smiled. 27? 27. Really? I was thinking about playing 35. But you know what? I like your face. Let's go with 27. With that, the man completed his slit and paid for his lottery ticket. 
See you, pal. He said happily, and they patted Jack on the shoulder on his way out the door. Jack tried not to put any more thought into what ha what would happen to this man. Just let these things play out, Jack. You'll never guess how things end up, so just let yourself be surprised. The seer had advised him. Still, it was impossible not to wonder about these things from time to time. He knew, considering the way the seer worked, there was no way p possible that he'd actually help this man. But giving him a losing lottery number? That was too simple for the seer. And he couldn't imagine he'd actually given him a warning number, a winnings number, sorry. So that's how Jack was surprised when two weeks later he ran into the same man again, the town at the grocery store. Hey, buddy, it's you. I remember you. Check it out. I won. Indeed, the man looked like a mi looked like a million dollars, wearing new clothes, a new gold watch, and a big goofy smile. The man walked right up to Jack. I didn't think I'd ever see you again, but I'm glad you're here. I could have never won without you. Hey, let me buy these groceries for you. No, wait. That's not good enough for you. You're my good luck charm. I always got to treat people right. That's what my mom says. Reaching to his pocket, the man removed his checkbook and promptly wrote Jack a check for $10,000. It's the least I can do for my good luck charm. After thanking the man and feeling a bit confused by the whole thing, Jack raced home to his computer. After turning it on, the Sears writing appeared on the screen. Well, Jack, how does it feel to be $10,000 richer? It feels good, but I can't help but wonder. We'd never helped anyone before. Why are we starting now? Jack asked the question with a tinge of guilt. He never liked to admit that people were being hurt by his actions, but then his distaste and curiosity overwhelmed any Latin feelings of guilt. Latin feelings of guilt. Oh, Jack, we haven't helped anyone. Yes, that man is happy now, but he'll have lost every last penny within two years. You saw it for yourself. He just gives money away. Old friends, lost relatives... They're all going to come asking for money, and there will be some very bad investments as well. The stress of losing everything is going to cause his wife to leave him. He'll take the kids to, he'll be alone and broke, a ruined man who would have been much better off if he'd never won. You needn't feel bad, Jack, if the man's own stupidity and greed that will do this to him. Jack feels some regret, but the serious rationale rationalizing and focusing on his own reward always puts him at peace in the end. Through the years, no two tasks were ever alike. Sometimes the, effort, the, sometimes the effects of his actions were direct and easy to see. Other times, they caused a chain reaction so complex they simply could not follow it. Go to the country minister's building, park and base no, number 43 at 4.47 p.m. Came one such request. Jack did so, and two months later he met Donna, with whom he fell in love with and ending up marrying. He couldn't have even known the two events were even related if he hadn't asked the seer about it. Jack, when you park into that space, you caused the person who would have parked there to park in a different spot, but she bumped the car next to her. She barely made a scratch, but she called her insurance agent anyway, causing him to leave the office late. He missed his train home, and while waiting for the late train, he was mugged and stabbed. He'll never fully recover. The mugger took his credit cards and used them. And Jack, I could keep going with this, but there's another 23 people involved. Sometimes these favors are going to be very complicated. But let's just say your action ultimately caused Donna to be in the exact right place for you to meet her. Jack's relationship was a seared grew. Though remaining most mostly mysterious, the seer dejavished enough information over time so that Jack could get a generalized understanding of the seer's history from historical references. Jack knew the seer was thousands of years old when still alive. The seer had been a powerful fortune teller and artist who foretold future happening through paintings. A foolish king who misinterpreted the seer's prediction and lost the battle as a result had the seer executed on ants cumbered, unencumbered by physical senses and existing in a lonesome void. The seer's abilities expanded. Following the communicate to communicate with the living, the seer began reaching out to those who would respond including Jack, and of course, the seer knew everything about Jack. 
in all, it was as much as, as much of a friendship as one can have with a dead person. And Jack was grateful to the seer too. He had a nice job, a nice house, a beautiful wife, and people respected him. He was happy, which is something he never really felt between before the seer contacted him. Twelve years in total passed. Twelve good luck. Twelve good years for Jack. Task after task was completed, usually at about one every month. Jack sitting in the office of his large rural house was contacted by the seer once again. Hi, Jack. I have a favor to ask of you. This one's the easiest yet. You don't even have to get up. Call reg- regular pizza in exactly two minutes. Let the phone ring three times. Then you hang up. Jack smiled, nice and easy. He no longer wondered about how these tasks would play out. He trusted the seer and simply did and as he was told. Jack made the call exactly two minutes later. The quietness of the household was broken 30 minutes later by the ringing doorbell. That's odd. Jack thought neither neither he nor Donna was expecting anyone. Jack looked out the people and saw a pizza delivery boy. The local on the cat said Regnal Pizza. <coughs> Regnal's Pizza, sorry. Jack opened the door. Here's your pizza, said the boy as he thrust it into Jack's hand. But I didn't order this, Jack argued. Look, I don't give a damn if you ordered it or not. Mr. Raggo told me to take it here, so that's what I'm doing. The delivery boy argued as he looked increasingly annoyed and spat in the bushes. Jack looked at the boy in front of him. He looked to be about 17 years old, but the most noticeable thing about him was his size. He was huge, probably about six and a half feet tall and very muscular. It's already paid for by credit card. Just take it because I'm not driving it back. The boy put out his hand for a tip. I don't have any cash on me, Jack told the truth. Whatever. Came to discuss the reply. The boy looked past Jack into the house. Then turned and walked slowly to his car waiting, looking over his shoulder as he walked. Jack closed the door and took pizza to the living room where Donna was sitting where Donna was watching TV. After explaining what had happened, he accused himself to go to his office promising to return shortly. Donna opened the pizza and took a piece. Come back soon, sweetie. This pizza's got all your favorite toppings on it. Donna giggled as she took a bite, arriving at his computer. The seer's words appeared on the screen. Confused, Jack? Don't be. Your neighbor down the road ordered the pizza. Mr. Raggle told that boy the correct address. But I'm going to bring him full and made it difficult for him to be heard clearly. Still... Give the boy credit. He got the street right at least. So my reward is a pizza? Jack typed a little confused. Yes, Jack. Your reward is a pizza. And also the change. And also the, sorry. Also the chance to spend a little time with your wife. Go down there. Share the pizza. Enjoy it. When you're done, make love. Oh, God. Make love to Donna. That's not one of your tasks. That's just some advice I think you should follow. Okay. Oh, by the way, your neighbors who ordered the pizza are arguing right now over the silly fact that the pizza didn't arrive. Some of the things people argue over amaze me. They really do. Their fight is going to get very heated, but you don't need to worry about that. Go enjoy your night. Jack followed the seer's advice, cuddled with Donna as they enjoyed their meal. They made love. Okay. (laughs) Okay. We're going to skip that part. Donna fell asleep on the couch shortly after 11 o'clock p.m. Uh, Jack lay there awake. This lady's favor, it just felt odd. Carefully extracting his arm from under Donna, Jack left the living room and headed upstairs. Sitting down at the computer, Jack typed, Are you there? Yes, Jack. I'm always, I'm actually always here. I've been waiting for you to come back. That piece of delivery boy, he's quite a specimen, isn't he? Jack looked quizzically at the screen, the seer continued. He's a horrible employee. He was hired only three days ago, and already Mr. Rago wants to fire him. But as a physical specimen, he's strong, fast, and very observant. For example, he noticed that you didn't lock the front door after he delivered your pizza. What? Jack said at last. He started to get up. Sit down, Jack. I need to tell you something important. Unlocking the door now won't change your situation. Jack slowly took his seat again at the computer, looking behind himself as he did so. You see, Jack, it's true that I never lied to you. Everything I've told you 
is 100% honest. But yes, I withheld certain facts. You see, I told you that every task causes something bad to happen to someone else and something good to happen to you. But there's a third thing. There's the ultimate goal that each task was working toward. Each task is working toward. Remember, Allie? Of course you do. But you probably, what you probably don't remember about her is that she was helping to pay her brother's way through college. When she died, he had to drop out. She was going to be a great uh, psychologist, but now he worked in the factory instead. That's really too bad for a pizza delivery boy. He could have used a good therapist a few years ago, but that good therapist wasn't there for him. Instead, he got some Freudian quack. Remember our lottery winner? Yes, you do. He was a neighbor to our pizza boy. After he lost all his money, of course, he beat the boy senseless after the boy jumped into the street in front of his car. Quite a traumatic memory for, for our young lad. And his mother didn't care at all about that incident, didn't protect the boy at all. She couldn't. Not after using all the drugs given to her by her boyfriend, who happened to be one of the muggers who robbed the insurance agent. He bought the drugs with the money he made from the robbery. Do you see now the scope of my artistry? Ar artistry? Sorry. Jack sat glaring at the monitor. He wanted to get out to check on Donna, but he was too scared to move. This year continued. Jack, you made, you done over a thousand tasks for me, and each one have served an ultimate purpose, to psychology, to psychology destroy this boy, turn him into a monster, and to bring him here tonight. Don't you see, Jack? This involved ten of thousands of people and billions of possibilities. If you had failed to complete even one of the tasks, the whole chain would have collapsed. This was orchestrated by me and set in motion by you. Together, we've done something wonderful. This is a masterpiece of human manipulation. Our masterpiece. And it all begins and ends with you. Two perfect points in time. Tonight, wrong address, no tip. The poor boy finally snapped. He's downstairs right now. He's slitting... What? Hey, yo, what? Second moment, Jack could hear a short muffled scream coming from the living room, followed by a gurgling noise. No, Jack screamed, stood up, there in the front of the stairs. Jack, stop, the voice startled. Jack, it was inside his head. For the first time, the seer was talking to him directly. It was a pleasant voice, a feminine voice. You can't do anything. She's already gone. He'll be coming for you shortly, and you can't stop him. But why? Jack cried with tears welling up in his eyes. It's not an artistic masterpiece if it doesn't begin and end with you, Jack. Her voice was soothing. I want you to appreciate the fact that I'm talking to, to you directly. This requires all of my energy, and as a result, I, I'll have the rest for several years before I can contact anyone again. That's how special you are to me. Please don't feel bad about this, Jack. I want you to take a moment and enjoy our accomplishment as much as I can, as I do. The voice paused briefly and then continued. Do you know what, Jack? If I had never contacted you, you would have, you would have lived for 85 years. 85 boring, meaningless, and bitter years. And when you died, nobody would, would have been at your funeral. I gave you 12 great, meaningful years. You were happy and together. We did something beautiful, something unique. Jack paused a moment and considered his twelve years of happiness and his tears of sore mixed with tears of joy. He turned and looked at the computer while behind him, the massive hawk of demented delivery boy appeared in the doorway, a bloody knife in his left hand. On the screen, the last words from the seer appeared. Don't you have something to say to me, Jack? Jack wiped his tears and absorbed everything the seer had just told him. And the hawk started stepping closer to him. Jack said, Method his final words. Thank you. Oh my goodness, what? Credit credit to Thomas O. And this story is insane, y'all. What? We don't talk about Bruno. No, 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 no. I don't want to listen to that song. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed that reading. As always, stay safe and take care. And I'll see you guys when I read some more. Bye-bye.